Okay, in this presentation, I will be reviewing project objectives, the materials that we'll be using for this uh, art piece, which will be primarily foam, and different design exercises that you can use as a starting point. I'll also show visual examples of student work from prior terms. We have two objectives for this project. The first is to effectively apply techniques and methods of subtractive carving to create a dynamic freestanding sculpture with multiple vantage points. The next is to be able to use the elements of form, volume and mass, and texture to plan, model, and fabricate a successful 3D composition. Some materials and tools from your, your toolkit you'll want to get out is the foam sculpture block. This is a six by six by six inch block. The sculpture block tool set, modeling clay, sandpaper, gesso spray, and paper and pencil. And just like with the prior project, if you decide that you need additional tools, feel free to use them. You might decide that you need a nail file or a steak knife or a drill bit. By all means, you can scavenge or buy whatever tools you need to convey your idea. I've outlined in your project handout 13 exercises you can use as a starting point. Keep in mind that abstract, non-representational ideas work best for subtractive sculpting. So in other words, you wouldn't want to sculpt a likeness of your favorite uncle or a hyper-realistic portrait of your cat. Keep your ideas simple, focused on geometric forms, and dynamic movement. So one, one idea is to create a new form from the abstraction of a human figure. And I'll show you an example of a student that used this as a starting point. Another idea is to invent a new mechanical form with an unknown function. You could suggest tension between connected forms. Utilize surface treatments like texture to emphasize the particular characteristics of different forms. Choose a famous sculptor to mimic. Make six new planes, each of a different proportion. Make a piece that rests on three points of contact with the ground plane, so in other words, a tripod. Incorporate at least one whole, one convex form and two sharp edges. You could use a combination of concave and convex forms and surfaces. You could utilize a spiraling motion to activate the form, but not carve a spiral. I'll show you an example of a student that chose this one. You could create the illusion of two interlocking forms, make a solid object appear to be bound or wrapped, or you could employ repetition of a shape. Here's an example of student work from a previous term, and if we use our imagination as a viewer, you may be able to see a human figure reclining on its side with its knees kind of pointed up, its hands resting on its knee. And this would be a headless figure. And if you're interested in creating an abstract human figure, you may want to research the artist Henry Moore. He's famous for work like this. And keep in mind that a lot of these exercises are so basic that no matter what your idea, they, they could qualify as two different exercises as we see here. So the, the primary contour of this piece looks like a mechanical form. So if we look on the primary contour here, it almost looks like a pitted metal anvil. But then the student went a step further and made it look like drippy organic lava is dripping out of the hole here. So they've not only been inspired by mechanical form, but they've utilized two different surface treatments to make contrast between the soft oozy drips and the pitted metal. One option is to make a piece that rests on three points of contact with the ground plane. So here we see almost like a tailbone on this creature. One, two, three. I see this as an abstracted creature. If you use your imagination, you might see these as orbits for eyes. 
but that's another fun piece. This design qualifies as three different um, exercises. So one is to create a new form from the abstraction of the human figure. Um, many viewers saw this as the abstraction of a face. If this is a jaw, this is hair, this could be almost an abstract brain form. Um, another exercise was to utilize surface treatments to emphasize the particular characteristics of different forms. So we see the chiseled brain contrasted from the smooth, almost bone-like portion there. And then another exercise was make a piece that rests on three points of contact with the ground plane. So this piece is casting beautiful shadows on the ground plane here because it's suspended. But we have one, two, and then behind three. So that was a really great decision by the maker to make that portion suspended. It adds great contrast from the back piece and beautiful shadows on the tabletop. Here's a side view. And you can see the shadow is actually a perfect oval. One thing to keep in mind as you develop your ideas is that you want a balance of positive and negative space in your design. And I'll show you an example of one that didn't really have good balance. Uh, this piece is a good example because the artist carved out certain portions so that the viewer, when they're seeing the piece from this vantage point, can look through the negative space, see the form on the other side. That might entice them to walk around the piece and view all sides. Think about the primary and secondary contours of the form. So the primary contours are the outside edges. The secondary contours are these internal edges. And this piece is, is successful because these secondary contours or this ridge leads the viewer's eye around, almost like a road map around the piece, and that encourages the viewer to examine all sides. One thing to keep in mind as you plan for this project is that foam can be very, very fragile. So if you're carving away and you have any pressure at all on thin pieces, they can pop and break very easily. So I would avoid foam portions that are less than one inch in thickness. This piece was really pushing the bounds of fragility here. Here's an example of a piece that actually broke in progress. This was supposed to have a, um, almost a symmetrical portion in this area, but it broke away and I encouraged the student to refine that area anyway and it still ended up being a very strong piece. It was inspired by a vertebrae. So this would be an organic sculpture. Might remind the viewer of a weathered shell or bone. And uh, one thing to keep in mind, if things don't go as planned and a portion of your sculpture breaks away, it's not game over. Sometimes you just have to, to reevaluate and it ends up being a stronger sculpture in the end. I mentioned before that successful 3D compositions have multiple vantage points. So we can see from the uh, front and back view of this piece it looks completely different. You also want to consider what the ground, how the ground plane is interacting with the tabletop. So if you imagine that this artist did not carve away this um, area here, it would not have been nearly as interesting. I also like that the shadow cast on the tabletop is a perfect square. So again, if this piece did not have this carved portion, these ridges that come up and these undercuts, it would not be nearly as interesting. And this is one where I feel like the artist could have balanced positive and negative space a little more successfully. If some of these areas were completely cut away and the viewer could look through and see the other side of the piece, this piece would be much more successful. This uh, design contrasts surface very successfully where the inside edge this edge here, this plane, 
is very uh, chiseled and it contrasts greatly with the smooth edge here. This design was very, very fragile. I don't suggest that you create a sculpture quite this thin and um, with so much negative space, but it is successful in that the repetition and rhythm of the surface and form is very dynamic and leads the viewer's eye throughout the entire piece. Uh, this artist chose to use a combination of concave, meaning sunken in, and convex, so pushed out forms. And this is a good example of using a spiraling motion to activate a form, but not carving a spiral. So you can see that this piece is curved in, kind of spirals in this upper piece kind of spirals in almost like the peak or crest of a wave. And if we use our imagination, we, this almost looks like a graffiti S. So it's not one of the exercises, but if you're really into uh, typeface, you might take inspiration from stylized letters for this project. So let's talk about the procedure. So the step, step one which is 25% of your final grade for the project, so keep that in mind, is research and planning. I want you to choose at least two of the following design exercises that are in your handout to use as a starting point. So create one idea sketch for each of the chosen exercises. One drawing for each design is the very minimum. Remember, we're creating three-dimensional art, so in most cases, it's necessary to show more than one view of your idea, and you can see that I've done this with this idea here. The front side is much different than the back, so I needed to show both faces. You should have a minimum of two drawings for your planning and research. And if you choose exercises one, two, or five, you will need to submit a reference image. So for this one, I chose to be inspired by a famous sculptor, Stephanie Metz. So I wanted to share, or it was necessary for me to share reference image of her work. Now I'll add to that. If you choose to be inspired or to mimic a famous sculptor, because you are students and you're learning, this is okay. We don't have copyright infringement to worry about. If I was a professional artist, I would not want to create a replica of a famous sculptor's work and pass it off on my own. That would be copyright infringement. That would be stealing original ideas. So I'll be using Stephanie's work uh, for my demonstration, but I will only be using it for my demonstration. I will not be applying to exhibitions or sharing that as my own work. And here's another idea sketch. I had to label this area to make a note for myself that I want to create a dimpled contrasting surface there. I only use one view for this piece because it's ve very similar on the other side. Our next step will be to get our modeling clay out and create a small scale model of the design. This would be after I see your images and um, approve which one I would like you to move forward with. So this model will serve as a detailed plan and will really help you when you begin to sculpt your foam block. Unlike wire sculpture where we could add on and remove portions that we disliked, with foam in subtractive sculpting, once it's gone, it's gone. So it's really important to make a model when you're doing subtractive sculpting. Be sure the model displays accurate edges, proportions, and positive and negative spaces. The more detailed and accurate the model, the more easier it will be to sculpt in foam. Uh, the third step will be to watch the subtractive sculpting demonstration on Canvas. And while you're carefully observing your clay model, I want you to use a pencil to sketch the silhouette of each face of your model on the foam block. So you'll want a bird's eye view, a worm's eye view, and various profile views. Keep in mind that the scale of your model will need to be enlarged at least two times. 
you want to use as much of the foam block as possible. When you have the faces sketched on the foam block, you'll use your loop tool or your scraper tool and rasp to slowly start to subtract material away. At this point, you'll want to wear your dust, dust mask. And um, as you start to refine the foam, you may need to pause every so often and draw more guidelines and roll the foam block around so you can view your sculpture from different angles to make sure that you're subtracting away in the right areas. Here's an example of an artist that used a similar approach on a large piece of limestone. So you can imagine if you're using really expensive material like a large block of stone or marble, you would want to use those guidelines. You wouldn't want to just wing it. And then the final step after the original block is obscured, you'll want to double check all faces of your sculpture to ensure that the edges, proportions, and positive and negative areas relate to your model. To refine the surface, you'll use the sandpaper provided. Again, you can use nail files or various other small files, even a Dremel drill if you feel like that is the best tool for your, to convey your idea. If you included texture portions in your design, please be sure that the smooth portions contrast to make the textured portions look intentional and not like it's an unfinished piece. When you're finished refining, head outdoors and spray an even coat of gesso onto all surfaces of your sculpture. You may need to apply a second coat after the first coat dries. Be sure to read the label on the can. You need to shake the gesso and um, apply thin coats. You must do this part outdoors or in a well-ventilated garage. You don't want to make yourself sick. I wish you the best of luck as you pursue this next project, and please let me know if you have any questions along the way.